All right, so let's begin. Hello and welcome everyone to today's uh, session. Um, this is our virtual program week and for the first session we are um, starting off with our ultrasound program. Um, I'd like to introduce myself first. I am Grace Acosta. I'm the Associate Registrar for Enrollment Management and Systems, and I will be your host for today. And so for today's session, just like I've mentioned, we will be hosting the ultrasound program. And I'd like to introduce and call our panelists, um, who, whom I'm going to start with, of course, our program chair, Hasina Jaffer. Hi, everyone. Nice to meet you all. I'm Hasina Jaffer. I'm the academic chair here for our critical care program. So that includes um, ultrasound, of course, and a few others, um, our cardiovascular perfusion program, respiratory therapy, and the anesthesia assistant program. Amazing. Thank you, Hasina. And with us today is also our one of our wonderful program communication liaisons, um, Sheena. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us. My name is Sheena Bimji Hewitt. I'm uh, the program communication liaison for our program at the Michener, and I'm also a, a teacher in the program as well. So we look forward to all of your questions. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Sheena. Uh, we also have our student ambassador for the ultrasound program today. Lindsay, would you mind coming over? Sure, hi, my name is Lindsay. I'm a second year ultrasound student. I'm currently in my clinical placement. So I'm at the uh, Women's College Hospital in downtown Toronto. And I'm really happy to answer your questions today. Amazing. Um, just to also share, Lindsay is one of our wonderful um, ambassadors for the ultrasound program and mentor. So if you have any questions at all, um, specific to student experience, please feel free to ask her questions um, throughout the webinar. So a, a couple of housekeeping items as well before we proceed with our presentation uh, for today, we will, um, you are all allowed to submit your questions through the chat. Um, we will be addressing them towards the end of the presentation or um, our wonderful admissions team is also here, will be helping us um, answering some of the questions that comes in to our chat. Um, and before I even pass it on to my wonderful, uh, wonderful colleagues at admissions, I also want to call on my uh, my amazing team, um, Dylan Mapson, to begin with, to just introduce himself. Hello, everyone. I'm the admissions coordinator here at Michener. Awesome. Thank you, Dylan. And finally, um, Teresa. Good afternoon. My name is Teresa. I'm one of the admissions officers. Awesome. Thank you, Teresa. And with that, um, we are going to kickstart our um, presentation for today. Um, I'd like to call Teresa, my colleague for the land acknowledgement. For the land acknowledgement, we acknowledge the sacred land where we are today, which has been and continues to be the traditional territory of the Huron Wendat the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit River, among many other unnamed and unrecognized Indigenous communities. At this location, we stand on land protected by the Dish with One Spoon Treaty between the Anishinaabe, Mississaugas, and Haudenosaunee that bound them to share the territory and protect the land. We recognize this agreement not as a thing of the past, but as a promise today and into the future. We must share this responsibility of ensuring that the dish is never empty by taking care of the land and the creatures we share it with and transforming our personal and institutional relationships. This meeting place is still home to many Indigenous people across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work and learn on this land. We urge you as future Canadian healthcare practitioners and leaders to acknowledge that this is our collective responsibility to strengthen our ties within the communities we serve and practice, healthcare in a way that advances the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's seven health related recommendations and practice your profession in that spirit. So, we'll go over today's agenda. Um, I'll briefly talk about Michener's Advantage, and then you'll hear from our wonderful faculty and student panel. 
And then Dylan will go over the application process and also some information about tuition and other fees. And finally, we'll go through a live Q&A to cover any questions we may have missed during the presentation. So Michener um, has many advantages that we'd uh, like to share with you today. The first one is singular focus. So we have no distractions from our primary mission to educate health professionals and fulfill health human resources strategies of Ontario. We are part of the healthcare system. Since 2016, Michener is integrated with Canada's top hospital network, UHN, consisting of Toronto General, Toronto Rehab, Toronto Western, and Princess Margaret. So this provides Michener students immersion in patient care from day one. Experiential learning. 89% of Michener grads are satisfied with Michener preparing them for job success. And finally, we are career driven. 97% of Michener grads are employed in a job related to their field one year after graduation. Over to you, Grace. Start the discussion. Thank you, Teresa. And so now um, we're going to hop right into the panel discussion. But before we do that, I have a few, just maybe one or two um, very interesting facts about the program. And of course, the ultrasound program is one of our flagship programs at Michener, and it began or was established or um, launched in 1979 as a post-diploma program, along with immunology and the virology programs. Um, this is, of course, in response to the advances, um, advances in medical understanding, as well as technological innovation and computer science. And that said, um, the first question of the day is about the program itself. So. Can you tell us about the program and what makes the program or the profession unique? Um, maybe Hasina or Sheena, you could take this on. Sure, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to start off and then I will pass it along to, uh, to Sheena. So um, our program is a two-year program that runs across, I wanna say five semesters. Um, year one, it starts off in September and goes until December and then again, January to April. And the entire first year is mostly um, didactic courses. So there's a lot of lectures. And then coupled with that is a lot of hands-on labs um, and simulations. And you get a lot of interaction with faculty where you get face-to-face -face time with them. We have small class sizes, small class labs. Um, and you just get a lot of hands-on experience in addition to the didactic and theory. And then in the summer semester, um, it's mostly all simulations. So that really prepares you for your clinical year, which generally starts um, either the last week of August or the first week of September and runs along until I want to say mid-April. Um, I would say we have top of the line technologies here. We have amazing faculty and um, I will hand it off to Sheena to, to elaborate a little bit more. So that's a great question. Um, I'm pretty biased because I've been in the program uh, as a teacher and as a student uh, before that. So uh, the Michener program is very uh, unusual in that it's a post-diploma program. So it's not entry to practice. So you, we don't have students coming right from high school. Our students are more mature. Some of them have degrees, some have masters. Um, we get international physicians in our program. So it's a wide variety of students that join us uh, in order to learn about sonography. Um, our program uh, is, is, uh, was one of the first ultrasound programs in Canada uh, that had a school to train sonographers. Uh, now there are many, many varied ultrasound programs. 
were very well respected, not only in Canada, but also internationally. Um, our program itself is really good because it uh, blends learning so that you have a hybrid model so that you'll come into class virtually, so from home if you want, and then you are going to be coming onto the campus to do the labs. So you're going to have scanning labs as well as professional practice lab, which deals with patient care and professionalism. Amazing. Those are really great um, points, Shina and Hasina, and makes our ultrasound program so unique as well. And I think one of the most, um, I would say, frequently asked questions from our um, students is essentially about class schedules. Um, that said, I have a couple of questions, really. I'm not sure like how you guys are going to answer this, but would you be able to describe how classes are being conducted? And um, a follow-up question is really, in a typical day, um, how many hours are students um, expected to be in classes? Like, for example, if it's virtual, um, how many hours are they um, supposed to go into synchronous um, virtual lessons? or maybe in-person, as well as um, may maybe like self-study time. Sure, absolutely. I can um, I can start off and then I'll hand it over to Sheena again. So um, it, it varies by semester. Um, so for instance, I'll describe our fall semester this year. Um, so for our year one students, we have classes that are all um, online and synchronous on Mondays and Tuesdays, and they go from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. So there's two full days of didactic learning where you're just immersed in online labs. Um, Wednesday is a half day, so students have the afternoons off, for instance, to, to study or to review the material. Um, and then the last two days of the week, Thursday and Friday, consist of all hands-on labs and simulation. So that's the days that you're on site with faculty and your other colleagues or peers. Um, it's all hands-on, you learn from one another, and you're not on site both days, it's either one or the other. Um, the winter schedule is a little bit different, and then the summer is a lot of hands-on simulations. Um, in terms of hours, I would say, Sheena, what would you say would be the total number of hours that students spend um, between labs and lecture? I would say about probably 15 to 20 hours of studying a week. Um, just to digest all of that information, but in terms of actual hours, what would you say on average? I think for direct contact, um, because we have a modular schedule, so what that means is that uh, all the classes are done every week for 14 weeks of the semester, okay? So in the winter, for example, you could have classes from 9 till 12, and then you get always get a lunch break of some kind, at least for an hour. And then you would have another class from one to four. So we try and teach you, so you'll learn things uh, in a in a uh, in a manner that uh, that uh, will strengthen your knowledge in three hour blocks. So we have classes usually in three hour blocks. Your hands on lab though, where you learn how to scan, can be three to four hour blocks. Um, most of our, our uh, didactic and scanning um, is done synchronously, which synchronously means that we do live classes. There is a little bit of asynchronous work, but we uh, believe very strongly in being physically present, even though it's virtual. Um, and we find that that works really well for our students. So in the, in the, in the fall, you take five courses. Uh, three are academic courses and two are uh, more simulation courses, so scanning and professional practice. In the winter, you take three courses, but they're big courses, you know, and new knowledge. So it's uh, abdominal, patho abdominal and superficial pathologies, and then obstetrics and gynecology, and then you have scanning labs. And you will scan each other um, for the abdomen and for certain areas that are not private. You know, otherwise we have phantoms that we use for uh, things like obstetrics. Amazing. And um, just to um, probably you have answered this already, like um, outside of the direct um, or the instructional hours, like how many hours are 
students supposed supposed to devote for like their own study? Does it is it also like fifteen to twenty hours per week? Yes. So in Canada, we have a very uh, interesting process in order to be accredited by Accreditation Canada. So we, if you're an accredited program, you teach according to the national competency profile that is set by Sonography Canada, which is our national organization. So we all have to teach certain things. Now, our program um, is a short program. It's only a two-year program. So we have to teach a lot of stuff in two years, whereas other schools may teach all that stuff in four years. So it is a pretty intense uh, program, you, you know, so the workload is pretty heavy. So I would say for every hour of class that you have, you should have ideally an hour of homework to review, to summarize your notes, because all the information we're teaching you is not only important for your clinical practicum, but it's also important when you write the credentialing academic and the scanning skills exam for Sonography Canada. Yeah, that, that's really helpful, Sheena. Um, I think just equating to the number of hours that the students will have to be in class and then what would be the equivalent amount of time that they might be or must dedicate for um, their own self-study would be really important for them. Thank you. And we are going to jump right into lab and practical work. I know that um, both Hasina and Sheena has already kind of like um, gone through some of the information about lab and practical work um, earlier. However, um, I think for this question, um, students are also wanting to ask about how the lab classes are being conducted and specifically what equipment will students use in their labs? You know, I would love to hear that response from our student uh, because she's had the lived experience of being in year one and doing labs. Lindsay, do you want to start and I'll jump in? Yeah, sure, I can. So um, that's a great picture of the lab, basically. Um, we have it, it's everything that you need that you're going to experience in a hospital or in a clinic, basically. So you have your ultrasound machine. You get to see all of the different probes that we use, um, the stretcher. We do work on, you know, how to safely manage that. Um, and then we scan each other. So we're getting hands-on experience, like with all of the buttons, all of the probes, all of the different things the machines do. And, um, you know, the professors come around and they guide us. And it's just really our time to kind of explore the machine, get used to it, get used to scanning, um, practice our ergonomics and put a lot of the um, the stuff that we learn in class to practice. And for a lot of students, myself included, that is the key to making it all make sense by putting it into practice. And so um, I've really enjoyed the lab portions. Um, even the other class that's more of a simulated, it's about professional practice. And that's also really important to be able to um, really deal with patients in a safe and appropriate way. Um, so we do that as well. And um, we, you know, we, we use like wheelchairs to get hands-on learning with that because that's important to know how to do that. I've already dealt with some patients in wheelchairs and things like that um, at my clinical placement. So all of it, there's um, a method to the madness, I'll say that. <laughs> so Grace is, thank you, Lindsay. Um, so Grace is showing us our lab. So our lab does have barriers. So we have curtains for privacy. Uh, we left all the curtains out for this specific uh, uh, video so that you can see around the lab. So as you can see, the students are working on different machines with different people. So for example, right here, you can see the student is using a phantom. So this is called a low fidelity phantom. Um, and it's an obstetric phantom because you know it wouldn't be ethical to ask our patients uh, to be pregnant and for us to scan them. So we have these phantoms and our students uh, will scan the phantom and it's a still baby that's made out of plastic and some other things that looks very realistic. And they learn the basic of scanning a fetus 
without that fetus moving, which is really good practice when they get to clinical. Um, on the other bed there, um, as you can see, the machines are pretty much similar. It doesn't really matter what uh, what co company you use in ultrasound. Do you know? Uh, so we have four machines, uh, and two are uh, are the same, um, so that the students have a variety of machines to work on in the lab. So when they go to their clinical practicum, it's an easy transition. So this uh, here over in this bay, you can see that the student is scanning. Uh, looks most likely like they're scanning a thyroid gland. And then uh, the student way at the end is using a high fidelity simulator, which is called a scan trainer. Um, so you can see this is what we call simulation. So uh, it means it's very like um, going into a clinic or a hospital for real practice. But the biggest difference is that you're learning how to do ultrasound in a safe environment where you can make mistakes and learn from those mistakes. Uh, we emphasize ergonomics a lot because a lot of sonographers suffer from injuries and then their career is, is not viable anymore. So we, we harp on a lot about ergonomics and, and uh, so that you don't injure yourself during practice. Um, and as you can see, this, this lab is, is got similar equipment in each bay. And then you do with the same ultrasound machine, you can do all kinds of exams. You can do the abdomen, you can do male and female pelvis. We have phantoms for all the other stuff. Amazing. That's really great, Sheena. Yeah. I'm just going to unshare my screen once again. And... Let me just pull this. Tina and Lindsay, great job in describing um, all of our equipment. So I'm actually a non-sonographer. My background is respiratory therapy, so it's just great listening to, to both of them. Um, I'm glad that you mentioned that it's a safe space in our lab. Um, that's just one thing that I'd really like to highlight, that it is a space that's safe to make mistakes, that's safe to learn. Um, you learn from your colleagues, you learn from your own mistakes, and it, it's just great preparation for clinical. I think one of the things that I really like about our, our curriculum design is that what you learn, you apply. And 90% of what you learn, you will apply sometime in your practice. Amazing. Thank you, Sheena, and thank you, Sina. I just want to check in whether you guys can see um, the next slide. Um, awesome. Perfect. So one of the other very popular questions that we encounter from our prospective students is, how do clinical semesters work and what can students expect from their clinical semesters? And if possible, how many clinical semesters are there in, a, in the program? Sure, okay, perhaps I'll start off again and then I will hand it over to Sheena and Lindsay. Um, Lindsay's actually living it right now. <laughs> so um, in terms of our clinical year, it is about 30 weeks long. Um, some students are placed at one site throughout the entire year. Other students um, go to multiple sites or two sites. And you can either, our clinical partners consist of both community hospitals, um, academic hospitals and research hospitals, as well as independent health facilities. So that would just be like an outpatient clinic. Um, you would start at the ending of August, go until December, have a bit of a winter break, start again in January, and go again until mid-April. Um, you have the opportunity to scan real patients, and then you have the opportunity to attempt your CCSAs, which um, Sheena and Lindsay, I'll hand it over to you guys to talk a little bit more about. Lindsay, you want to go ahead? Yeah, I, I can speak about my placement specifically. Um, I know I've been talking to some of my other, um, my friends in the program and their experience is a little bit different. So depending on where you are um, and depending on, you know, if you're in a hospital or a clinic, it can look a little bit different, but the goal is obviously the same and that's to get you uh, competent in all of the different areas that we're taught. 
So um, my day looks like kind of a regular nine to five. I go in and I get to shadow um, like five-ish different sonographers, which I really enjoy because I get um, different feedback from different people and they all kind of have their own ways to scan um, and teach and you'll you'll see that with the faculty as well they kind of all have their own their own ways of um, explaining things and their own little tips and tricks on how to scan so the more exposure you can get to different um, sonographers I think the better and then um, yeah so I get all this practice to really get to see the pathologies in real life and um, you know, that's also a safe environment, even though we're out of kind of the Michener part, part of it and we're in our clinical, um, we still have our instructors to kind of guide us and um, get us to where we need to be and work on any problem areas. Everyone is a bit different, um, but so far it's been, it's been really good. That's good. actually a great, <laughs> sorry I interrupted you, Sheena. I was just going to say that's a great point about our instructors. So um, here at Michener, we have a CLO, a clinical liaison officer, and they are faculty members who are in charge of pretty much the entire uh, student group who's out clinically. Um, and then each one of our clinical placement sites has a lead clinical coordinator who the school connects with, and that role is mainly to support all of our learners. But throughout your day, as Lindsay mentioned, or throughout your rotations, you would be paired with a number of different um, preceptors. Yeah, so... Uh, and again, you know, to add a little more information to what Hasina and Lindsay have said, uh, you know, our design of our program from day one is to get you um, ready for your clinical practicum and therefore ready to work, you know. Um, so in our program, uh, we start off with, say, for example, I'll just give you a little example. You start with the abdominal ultrasound. So you will start with the different organs, you know, you'll practice uh, kidney, and then you'll practice liver. And then by the end of the winter semester, you can do a whole abdomen. And then in the summer, we have what we call ClinSim semester. So everything or 90% of what happens in the ClinSim sim semester is to get you ready to go to clinical. So here at school, in our simulated labs, you do all the normals so that by the time you reach clinical, you can do a full abdomen, you can do a full female pelvis, you can do leg dopplers. That's the basics that you should be able to do. Um, and then once you can do that, you're ready for your clinical semester. And we as a program vet each one of the, the uh, sites that we use to make sure that the workload is appropriate for the students, that the people that are going to be working with you are all registered sonographers with Sonography Canada. And so as a student, you know, every site will be different, just like every hospital and practice and protocols are different, uh, like Lindsay has mentioned. But the basics, the foundational stuff is, is pretty much the same. So at the clinical sites, you will work with your clinical educators who will supervise you. They may be one, they may be multiple, depending on the site and how they like to uh, do their education. But the consistency is that you're evaluated every three weeks, either formatively, which means they're not graded, or summatively, which means you are graded. Um, and this is a really important part because what we wanna see is we're not just going to have you do um, an evaluation without knowing how are you progressing first, you know? So we have these formative evaluations. Um, so every three weeks, you're doing some kind of evaluation. And by the end of your rotation, you've actually finished half of your credentialing exam, which is called the CCSA. It's the Sonography Canada Clinical Skills Assessment. And we use that actually nationally. Uh, so every accredited school will, will work with the CCSA and our students are evaluated. Our students are evaluated on the CCSA within the program, which is really beneficial because when you're finished, you've done half your credentialing. The only other half you now have to do once you pass is the academic Sonography Canada credentialing exam. So that in a nutshell is a clinical practicum. If there's something here you didn't understand, please feel free to ask, okay? Thank you, Shima. That is really very comprehensive. 
Um, and I guess that also makes the program so unique. And I think overall, like we have mentioned earlier during our mentor advantage, we're in most of our programs or really all our programs um, are very hands-on. So even before students go into clinical, there's clinical simulation semester that they could do practice. And by then, when, once they're moving on to their clinical semesters, um, they're very much ready to work. And since we're on the topic of clinical placement, I think the next, um, I would say question that students really ask is about professional licensing. Um, I'm sure, Sheena, you have mentioned earlier during um, our discussion about um, the clinical placement that there are certain, I would say, criteria that the students have already fulfilled. It's just like they need to write an exam, right? Um, can yes. you elaborate more about that? Sure. So, uh, you know, uh, Canada is very unique um, in the credentialing of sonographers. And the way it's very unique is Sonography Canada decided um, about 15 years ago, maybe maybe 17 years ago, uh, that writing an academic exam is really good. Of course it is, right? It tests your knowledge. But as sonographers, um, our bread and butter, our job is to scan a patient and to find pathologies. And so there's no, uh, in those days, you wrote an academic exam and that was it. So Canada decided, Sonography Canada decided, the board decided, that they would put a test in place that actually tests the sonographer's scanning skills. And not just the scanning skills, but the fact that they can pick up pathology. Because if a US sonographer cannot pick up pathology, that pathology is missed. So in Canada, um, our credentialing body is Sonography Canada. You can look it up um, on the web. And Sonography Canada has two exams. It has an academic exam, so it's a written exam, um, and it has a scanning exam. And in our program at the Michener, the scanning component is used in our clinical practicum. So if you're successful in your clinical practicum, that means that you have done the clinical skills assessment through Sonography Canada and passed it. As soon as you, you graduate from our program, we write a letter to Sonography Canada saying the student has graduated and has finished their CCSA successfully. They then allow you to write the academic exam. So our program, just to go back a pace, is called a generalist ultrasound program. And a generalist sonographer in Canada can scan abdomen, so adult abdomen, uh, male and female pelvis, including uh, transvaginal for the females, that you can competently scan obstetrics, gynecology, uh, leg venous Doppler, and that's it. They're always bringing new competencies and taking them away. So as a generalist sonographer, when you're finished, you can actually practice in any of those areas. So as a sonographer, you can do everything, which is what I did at University Health Network a long time ago, or, some of our students, when they go out to find a job, they say, oh, I don't want to do abdomen. I'm just going to do obstetrics, you know? So you can actually choose employment depending on what it is that you, you want to do. Did that? Did I answer your question there, Grace? Yeah, absolutely, Sheena. That was really very comprehensive. Um, I, think, I think just like a follow-up question to Sheena. Um, once they pass the Sonography Canada, can they practice um, to other provinces outside of Ontario? They can actually practice anywhere in Canada. If you have your okay. CRGS, you can practice anywhere in Canada. And just recently, Sonography Canada has made a, um, like a collaboration with ARDMS, which is the American Registry of Sonographers, that if you are a CRGS, you get automatic entry into ARDMS. So then you can work anywhere in America That's and true. around the world, really, because globally, ARDMS is, is uh, accepted everywhere. Right. Yeah, that is really very um, beneficial for our uh, prospective students to know that, of course, there's licensing requirement. And like after you have passed the um, Sonography Canada um, licensing uh, 
I mean, exam, then you're able to practice um, essentially everywhere across Canada and also in the U.S. So perfect. Yeah, only in the U.S. if they apply for the application for ARDMS. Right. ARDMS. Okay, yeah. perfect. Thank you, Sina. And then that kind of like concludes um, questions about the program itself. And we have Lindsay right here um, to talk about her experiences about the programs. Um, so I, I guess, Lindsay, can you just, um, oh, sorry. I'm so sorry. It's supposed to be the career prospects first. I'm jumping right ahead of myself. But um, can, Grace, yeah. can I just mention something that I forgot to add yeah, about sure. the clinical practicums? And this is something that every student should know, is that we try very hard to have GTA sites, clinical sites, but, you know, that's not always possible. You know, we, we, if we don't have a clinical site in the GTA, students will, will be asked to go to even other provinces occasionally. So they should at least know that fact. Yeah, that, that's really helpful, Sheena. Um, I mean, and that is also part of the post admission requirements we're in. Students will have to understand that during clinical, they might be placed outside of Ontario and they need to be ready for that as well. Thank you, Sheena. Um, so going on to career, um, where can graduates of the ultrasound program work? And would you be able to describe like how does the typical work day of um, a sonographer actually um, looks like? Sure, so I can get us started um, just in terms of where sonographers work, and then I'll let both Lindsay and Sheena jump in again with the details of a day in the life of a sonographer. Um, so you can work in outpatient clinics, you can work in hospitals. Some people go out and work in um, medical sales or the industry side of things. Um, I've known some sonographers to go into quality improvement and research, so there's that avenue. And then, of course, there's education, like Sheena. <laughs> you can come back and be faculty here at Michener. Um, but in terms of the day-to-day, -day, I will leave it to Sheena and Lindsay. Lindsay, you want to jump in? Yeah, I can. Um, I, I think that a lot of people think of sonographers as it's a job that you're working very individually, but in reality, it's actually quite a team environment. Um, and that's something that I obviously learned as coming into this program, but um, my day in the life kind of looks like getting there, making sure all the rooms are ready and clean. Um, we have like um, sanitization protocols that we have to follow, especially at a hospital, especially after COVID. Um, so, you know, we check the list of patients, see what um, what's on the list for scheduled types of exams. Like we have days blocked off for obstetrics. So it's majority obstetrics. And then some days are majority um, abdomen and small parts. So we get that ready. And then, yeah, we just kind of go through all of the patients. Different sonographers take different ones. Um, we complete the case. We write up the reports. And then we present the case to a radiologist. So um, they will either tell us, hey, you didn't get enough images of this, or hey, can you go investigate this further, or they'll approve like your work, and then you can send the patient off. And yeah, some of my favorite parts is actually interacting with the patient and kind of getting to know them, um, making it a bit more personal, which also helps them feel more comfortable too, because your job isn't just scanning and, you know, high and by, it's also, you know, making them feel like you care about them, which I hope as healthcare professionals, you do, you know? So um, yeah, and a lot of the sonographers also, they all tell me they're continuously learning even though they're graduated and they've been working in the field for a long time. So they constantly ask each other questions or constantly learning from each other. So it does feel like a family and a team environment. That's really great perspective, Lindsay. Um, Sheena, do you have something to add in? Yeah, Lindsay, that's such a wonderful perspective. You know, it's funny how you, you tend to just take things for granted. I mean, the patient should always, you know, be the center of your care. And, you know, if, if and you have to have empathy and compassion. I think that's such an important, people have proven, right, that anybody can learn a skill, but if that patient doesn't leave uh, your bay or your room without feeling God, good, you haven't done your job, you know? Um, so competency is fine, but I think all the other skills are so very important. I agree with you. I also would like to add that, you know, um, 
uh, sonographers, you know, when when uh, when sonography first started, uh, every, a lot of people would say, oh, you guys have such a cushy life, you know, you work from nine till three, you get lunch, you know, uh, that's not that's not the environment anymore. Uh, if you work in, um, you know, educational hospitals, um, you know, teaching hospitals uh, and academic uh, hospitals, you may have to do all kinds of shifts. There's on call, there's midnights, um, you know, so be prepared, uh, you know, and it depends on what it is that you want from your profession, right? Um, if you don't want to work um, shifts, then, you know, uh, most independent health facilities that we call clinics, they're private clinics, uh, they may go to like seven, uh, but they don't usually do overnight shifts, you know, but also the practice is very different. You know, if you want to work with acute patients and have that adrenaline rush and all the excitement going on, you're going to pick like a hospital, you know, but if you're that kind of person that, oh, I don't need excitement in my life, I just want to go in, do a great job and come home, you may pick something that's a little bit not as 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 uh, adrenaline rushing as as the other one. Sonographers, um, my my students, uh, you know, in the past long long time, I won't say how many years, uh, have have done some amazingly out of the box things. You know, you you work in a sonographer as a hospital in the clinic. Yes, of course. You know, you can go after a few years. You can go into applications. Um, I have in my career got at least five of my students that have become educators you know, uh, who are teaching in different universities and colleges and ultrasound programs. Um, you can do research. I have had two students who uh, became full-time research fellows, you know, in ultrasound. So there's a lot of options as to what to do. You may not get into those options right away. You may want to, you know, practice for five years, uh, you know, and get a really good handle on ultrasound because it's not easy. And then you can branch out and do, you know, whatever your heart desires. That's really great, um, Sheena. I mean, Asina, Sheena, and Lindsay, thank you so much for providing your um, input on that. That's really very, I would say, informative, especially having to have some variations, like for career prospects, that it's not just the hospital you could work. Um, I mean, in medical sales, you could also work in clinics, really depending upon your I would say what you you foresee yourself doing um, in your profession. Um, and so one of the last questions for our panel really is about the student experience. So it's all on you, Lindsay. Um, do you mind um, telling us why did you choose um, the ultrasound program um, for your for your profession and also what's what's it like so far? Yeah, so I knew I wanted to do ultrasound from um, very early on. I don't I don't even know if Sheena knows this, but um, my mom had some medical issues. She was diagnosed with um, cancer, I think, 10 years ago now. Um, she's she's OK. But um, one thing that I really noticed was that consistently it was always the sonographers that showed so much empathy and compassion and truly made a difference in her healthcare kind of journey. Um, and I, I kind of wanted to be a nurse, but kind of didn't, I, I thought somewhere in the healthcare field would be good. But as soon as I had those experiences with the sonographers, I thought, you know, I, I could do that. And it would be really cool to be able to make a difference in patients lives in the same way that my mom did. So, um, I, my background is in health and physical education. I did, um, I went to a school that was a bit smaller, like the class sizes were about 30 to 40 students. And um, I really learned well that way. So that was one of the the draws to Michener is that they have smaller class sizes and you can get more, you know, one-on-one -on -one experience and learning with the, the faculty, like we've already mentioned. Um, and the other thing was that this program is kind of a, a fast-tracked program, right? It's two years, um, having already done a degree, it was a nice thought to kind of be able to do this program and then be working. And ultrasound is such a in-demand field right now that that was it kind of seemed like a no-brainer. So um, that's, yeah, that's why I wanted to do ultrasound and why I chose Michener. Awesome. And I guess like one, one more thing that we'd like to ask you, we only have a, a few more minutes left and we have a few um, questions, I think, that we've received so far. Um, what would be your advice to the future students of this program? Yeah, 
Um, so as Sheena said, <laughs> ultrasound is not easy. Um, and this might sound a bit cheesy, but I always tell students to just remember your why, you know, like remember why you started and why you wanted to do this and let that be your motivating driving factor to not giving up because there are going to be times where you feel overwhelmed. Um, you know, fast tracked program means that we have to cover a lot of material in a relatively short period of time. So it's not easy, but it's doable as long as, you know, you're dedicated and you spend the time studying, you get help um, early I know Michener has an amazing student success network that um, I can answer questions about that later if, if students want to. Um, they have things like counseling and free tutoring and um, workshops and things like that. And me coming from out of province, that was a huge, huge help because not only for, you know, dealing with the stresses of being in school, but also being away from family and stuff, having those services was kind of it made all the difference right and and then having the support from other students um missioner being so small you know the students become more close-knit so you get support that way and um yeah so my my advice is just to not give up and remember your why amazing that's really a great advice nancy thank you so much and so now we have wrapped up the panel discussion I'm going to invite my colleague, um, Dylan Mapson, to just briefly go over the application process as well as the tuition fee um, component of the program. Over to you, Dylan. All right, great. Next slide, please, Grace. <laughs> All right, so first and foremost, when considering applying for our programs, we strongly, strongly recommend reviewing the admission requirements. It's very most important aspect of when you're applying because our admission requirements are quite literal. Um, so I saw a question earlier in the chat, what if I don't have a 3.0 CGPA? For ultrasound, that is a minimum require, required score. So that's an absolute requirement. Um, so step two, once once you've reviewed the admission requirements, we then encourage you to prep your supporting documents. So we have pretty, pretty specific timelines. Applications typically open in October of each year and close on the 1st of February. We give applicants until the 8th of February to submit all of their official transcripts and any outstanding courses via official transcript. So it's important to prep your supporting documents, make sure they're ready to go. Um, and then step three, I kind of already addressed that, but it's really about the deadlines. Things need to be in by the 1st of February, aka on OCAS, specifically for ultrasound. Uh, and then there's, there's an application fee and a supplemental fee totaling $180. Uh, step four is register and complete the CASPER. So once you do uh, submit an application on Ontario Colleges, you will receive... Uh, in about three to five business days, an acknowledgement email. On said acknowledgement email, your Michener ID will be given to you. That Michener ID is what allows you to register for Casper and have your ID slash your test result be sent towards uh, Michener. Um, so it's important to really be in contact with uh, Casper slash Take Altus to make sure that your test result is being directed to Michener. Very important. And we're just going to highlight here that the last date is the 22nd of February. So if you recall, I mentioned that February 8th official document deadline. This does not apply to the Casper test. The Casper test can be taken on any of the dates that we have published on our website. If you simply Google Casper Michener, it'll bring you right to the page where all of our approved dates for the 2024 intake will be found. Uh, last but not least, um, you've prepared your documents. We need them submitted. And again, this is a reiteration, but it's the 8th of February. That is the final deadline. So that is an equal consideration deadline. Um, anyone who submits documents by that date is given equal consideration by assessment. So there's no rush to be the first to apply. As long as you apply by the 1st of February, have your documents in by the 8th of February, and you complete one of the approved CASPER dates, you will be considered for admission. Uh, now, moving on to tuition and other fees, uh, I will not break them down one by one, but let's just say for first year, you can see how uh, fall, winter, and semester are the, free, the three first semesters that will be um, uh, completed as a student. And then you can see that there's tuition and then other fees 
with a total fee in the final column of our um, graph here. And now we are running very short on time. So I'm going to be as quick as possible here. We've been trying to answer questions as, they, as we go through. I see Sheena there typing away like a mad woman answering these questions. Um, so I'll skip above what she's answered to, and do a couple live. So I addressed the CGPA. Uh, sadly, that is a minimum requirement. So if you do not have 3.0, that, that that's a must. Uh, and it does need to be from a Bachelor's of Science degree or a Bachelor's of Arts in Kinesiology. Um, I see Lindsay has addressed the question on how to prepare students for relevant certifications or exams. Uh, Sheen has addressed quite a few up here at the top. Um, so just as, a, as an attendee, if you are wondering what I'm talking about, there's this Q&A section um, and answers are being provided by certain uh, members of our panel, but we're gonna do a couple live. Um, so um, Dylan, yeah. um, if anybody wants me to expand on any of the answers I've given, I'm more than comfortable doing that. I was just vigilant about the time because it's almost five o'clock. Um, Great, thank you for that. I just see one that hasn't been answered, which is wonderful. Uh, and it's what's included in the CASPER test. It's a requirement for admission. Yeah, so the CASPER test is um, a separate exam that is required for all applicants to the program. Um, it is what we call like a soft skill exam. Uh, it's not the type of exam you, you necessarily study for. Uh, it's um, uh, trying to test people on their sociability and other soft skills, let's say. Uh, there's a lot of information about it online. Uh, I do recommend reading up on it before you do complete the test, but do know that it is an absolute requirement and it must be uh, completed for you to be ranked in our admission process. I do not see any other questions that haven't been addressed. So we'll give, we have two minutes. Uh, I'll just wait to see if anyone requires any expansion. Uh, just submit another question. Um, There's a, one question there, Dylan, the anonymous attendee it says on the website for admissions, need a bachelor of science or bachelor's of art and kinesiology. Um, so yes, you do need a bachelor's of science. Um, it has to be in health if possible. That's that's the one that uh, I think we've got that on the website. Um, and the only other prerequisites are the anatomy and physiology, which are a requirement. And uh, our admission staff is very happy to answer any admission questions to admissions, plural with an S, at mitchner.ca. Uh, if you're unsure about your degree, about specific courses you've completed in your degree, we are happy to review that because uh, we do want people to be informed before they pay any money. And that, that's my overall tip is make sure you have your transcripts, you're confident in your uh, your degree and your CGPA before you, you pay any money because we don't want anyone wasting any money. I think there's no other questions left. And so maybe um, Dylan will just proceed with just some of the closing slides. Sure, yeah. So um, we hold an Ask Me session. It's a one-on-one -on -one drop in session each Wednesday, uh, starting at 1230 uh, EDT and ending or EST, I guess it is now, and ending at 130. Um, so this is open to anyone. Uh, you can register for these. Uh, it's it's a it's a not a Zoom, it's a, pardon me, a Teams drop-in. So if you have Microsoft Teams, uh, you can register and drop in, and we try to address your questions uh, one on, in a one-on-one -on -one fashion um, so we can be um, more personal there and to, to specific prerequisites and other, other things you may be interested in discussing. Amazing. Thank you. So we do have some upcoming information sessions. Um, they're all available in our website. And if you are interested, especially for the December 7th webinar, it's about um, everything about admission requirements. So feel free to register for that particular um, webinar. And um, our offices right now is currently open. Um, we are accepting um, phone calls during Tuesdays and Thursdays. Uh, we're also now open for um, in-person visits only just during Tuesdays and Thursdays. And of course, our main point of communication as always is through admissions at pitchner.ca. So please feel free to um, send in your questions 
about the ultrasound program in general, or at the same time, the admission requirements. And with that, oh, sorry. Just, Lindsay, sorry, no, it's okay. I just put my um, email in the chat, but I'm not sure if everyone can see it. I don't know if um, it's okay for me to share um, since I'm a mentor for the ultrasound program and I'm more than happy to answer any questions as a prospective student um, need advice or anything like that. Um, if you guys want to write it down, it's just um, two, two, and then the letters LRL number one at Michener.ca. Amazing. All right. With that, um, we are so happy for your time and we thank you for attending our session. And um, this video recording will be available soon. So for those of you who are unable to join us, feel free to watch our um, video recordings. So thank you so much, everyone, on behalf of the panel. And may you have all a very great night. Bye, everyone.